In the background, you can see a white fence and maybe a little blivet um, in the distance behind that. That was part of our pilot's quarters. And to the right in the distance is a Vietnamese village. And uh, between the village and that white fence is what we call the berm line. <clears throat> our particular company had a long section of that that we had to protect when we weren't flying. Well, we protected it 24 hours a day, but uh, with special squads and platoons. But uh, uh, officers had to routine, routinely go out there and be uh, what we called ODs, officers of the day. So when you weren't flying, you were doing some other duties. The middle picture there is me sitting at uh, my desk. And that's about August of uh, 71. Uh, at that time, I was an acting operations slash executive officer for a while. Our, sl our flying time had slowed down significantly by that time, uh, particularly after Lamson ended. And the picture at the bottom, <clears throat> that's uh, one of the Chinooks, and those are revetments there. You can see in the background a couple other Chinooks, and I don't know how close you can see it, but in the very background, you'll see our hangar. Uh, it's got some metal missing. Uh, we had had a nice little storm blow through sometime before that picture was taken, and we hadn't actually got a chance to put the whole thing back together again. <laughs> That particular Chinook is a C model. We flew B and C models. That was one of my favorite. That's a C model there. Um, and then on the right, the uh, that's one of the pictures was taken during a board ceremony. <clears throat> that's myself uh, getting a DFC in on me by the commanding general of the 101st, General Tarpley. Uh, the two fellows to my well, immediate left, uh, were part of my crew. We had five man crew and we we're down to three. Uh, he came down, uh, this was sometime in mid March, right towards the 45th day of Lamson, uh, which is central to my book. But that's, uh, that's what that picture represents. Can you tell us while we're on this page and since it does tie in so closely to, um, those, I, those, the time period that is in your book. Can you tell us, give us a little context to, because this was in 1971, so the war had been going on, obviously, for, for several years. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit more about 1971 and, and kind of what, what the situation was over there, if you would, please. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> I reported in uh, to Vietnam on January the 5th of 1971 to start my year there. Uh, and I came home uh, just before Christmas of 71 and uh, December 21st, I believe it was the 22nd. When I came in, uh, the war had been winding down. Pre uh, President Nixon had, had started the Vietnamization project. Uh, it was slow to start in 70 as it went in towards the end of 70, but it picked up steam in 71. Uh, I flew into Saigon. Um, thought I was going to be stationed down there, uh, but they took all of the pilots that were coming in. We didn't know it at the time, but every pilot, new pilot coming in was sent up to I Corps, which is in the top of South Vietnam, and assigned to the 101st. Uh, they were beefing up the pilots that they could get because they were planning this big operation uh, called Lam San 719. So <clears throat> after getting there, I thought... Uh, Again, we'd be in the south, but we ended up going north, signed to the 101st. I reported into my company there probably about mid-January. Uh, the Screaming Eagles, uh, the 101st, had what they called CERT, Screaming Eagles Replacement Training School. So everybody, regardless of what they did, would spend a week in this before they were actually signed out to their unit. So um, I reported there first and spent a week in what they called Camp Evans, which was north away and just south of the DMZ. And there was about 40 or 50 of us in the group and they were getting us acquainted with the climate, the layout of the land. We had to requalify on weapons. And being an infantry officer, they made me take out a couple of night uh, ambushes right outside the wire and going, I'm here to fly, not to fight. But anyway, <laughs> I had to do that. So after a week, we, uh, I was actually taken to my company, which was the Chinook Company, A Company, 159th Aviation Battalion. Uh, we were called the Pachyderms, and every pilot uh, would be assigned a number, uh, one to something. One was always the, uh, the CO, 
and then any number uh, that was available up to a certain amount, I don't remember what it was, you would select uh, when you got there. In my case, 25 was available. I mentioned this to someone the other day, but I just turned 24 when I got over there, just before I got over there. And I figured I'd take 25 if I survived, I'd, I'd be 25 years old when I went home. So needless to say, the number 25 is one of my lucky numbers. Um, but shortly after getting there, uh, we uh, was assigned with more experienced pilots for a while and flew flew missions to get acquainted with the area, uh, which took into the end of January. We got called into a special meeting uh, one evening, all the pilots in our company, actually I understand across the entire division, announcing that we were going to be supporting this major operation, which was going to be an incursion into Laos starting uh, the first week in February, uh, that the South Vietnamese Armed Forces were going to uh, invade, if you will, into Laos, trying to cut off the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which ran deep into Laos uh, along a little river and a, a road called Route 9. Uh, so, but they didn't have the helicopters or aviation uh, assets to support that. So the Americans were tasked with doing that. So on the ground, you had about 22,000 South Vietnamese armed forces eventually committed to this operation, which was supposed to last 120 days, four months. And the Americans were to supply all the air support, the helicopter support, the fighters, bombers, and whatever it took. We weren't allowed to uh, set foot in Laos, uh, supposedly. And uh, Americans, would re we reactivated Quezon. Uh, we built it up even more to accommodate what amounted to over 750 helicopters uh, for this operation. The entire force for the 101st, which was about a 650 helicopters, was dedicated to the operation. We brought in other units from the south to augment that. Uh, and the reason uh, for that, I'll explain in a minute. But uh, once that was uh, set up, uh, the incursion started, it kicked off uh, the 1st of February and uh, with some insertions into Laos to establish fire bases along either side of Route 9, close into South Vietnam, to give the Arvin uh, a base to start from. And uh, basically operation was to go deep into Laos, uh, put fire bases on each side of Route 9 to go about 60 miles inside Laos, trying to cut off the trail coming from the northern part going to the southern part. So they were uh, setting up fire bases up and down uh, this route, leapfrog a little bit, and then a few more, and then a few more as they were going out. We were bringing them in and resupplying them. And then they sent uh, oh, <clears throat> several thousand uh, Vietnamese uh, army and ranger types uh, down Route 9 with armor trying to penetrate as deep as they could following that route. It's not like any highway or, uh, or dirt road you're familiar with in this country. It was literally uh, a dirt road with uh, hardly any road to it. But they were going down that trying to make their way into, uh, into deep, deep into uh, Laos. We uh, helped set up these fire bases. The first week or so of this operation was uh, not too difficult. We did take some fire uh, going in and out, uh, but as the North Vietnamese figured out what was going on, uh, they started bringing in heavy uh, units uh, uh, from the North. And before this ended, probably with by the end of the first month, and it ended up being a two-month operation, not a four-month operation because it got so severe, uh, they had dedicated almost 60,000 North Vietnamese troops to go against 22,000 South Vietnamese troops. Wow. So by the end of the second week, uh, fire bases were already starting to get attacked. Uh, the, the ones we put in first pretty severely, Firebase 30, 31, several others. Now, it was the Hueys. I was a Chinook pilot. Uh, it was the Huey pilots, the Cobra pilots, and the Loach pilots that I want to make it clear up front bore the brunt of this battle because they were in and out constantly at low levels. And they would be the ones to insert the troops. And once they got them in, then we being Chinooks, the bigger guys, we would fly in with uh, sling load stuff hanging below our helicopters and bring in their water, their ammunition, their food, their 105s, their heavy equipment. So we would have to come in and, and drop that stuff off and keep bringing it back and building supplies too. So we didn't do the initial assertions because you, you don't want to lose 25 or 30 guys in a chopper when you can only lose six or seven in a Huey. 
I'm talking about infantry people, not, not the crews. Uh, so we saw our share, though, the first couple of weeks. Uh, we were bringing this stuff in, and the Chinook's a much bigger target than the Huey. So it wasn't it wasn't too long before uh, we were sustaining a lot of our own losses, too, as Chinook pilots, at least crew members. And a couple of Chinooks would go down in the 60 days we were in there. Uh, we got about halfway to their goal, about 30 miles in, and we had maybe eight or nine fire bases set up. And the NVA was really pounding them then, and they actually started evacuating them by the end of the first month. Uh, and the, the, the higher ups, if you will, decided to uh, leapfrog way out to their destination, which was over 60 miles out. Firebase called Lolo was one of those. That was the furthest we had been uh, up to that point, and that occurred in early March. And uh, the first day in, they sent in to set up that base. I think there was even, a, I posted on my Facebook uh, some pictures of that. They uh, lost 11 Huey shot down and 33 battle damage on the first day. Wow. Getting that base set up. Um, Mr. Freeland, yeah. I wanted to ask you, I, I'm just totally engrossed, but I wanted to ask you something real quick because sure. when you were talking about going in, you're 24 years old, what mm -hmm. preparation did you have for this? Because I know, I mean, I'm not familiar with that. Obviously, you didn't just graduate from college and go over oh. there. You had you had the flight training. Can you tell us a little bit about that, too? Yeah, I can do that real quick. Uh, I graduated from college in 68. Uh, my draft board had been after me since I was a junior. Tried to get in the Navy aviation program, didn't qualify. Applied for the aviation program for the Air Force, did qualify. I uh, was scheduled to start OCS and flight school with the Air Force in this uh, September, October of 68. I graduated in June. My draft board wouldn't uh, give me a deferment, so I was drafted. Went in the Army, and I uh, was in there, uh, basic training, and advanced infantry training, and was recruited to go to Officers Candidate School, OCS, infantry at Benning, which I did. When I finished that, I was six months there as a training officer uh, with heavy weapons, and I met a bunch of Huey pilots, and they said, you don't want to go to Nam as an infantry guy. You want to go as a helicopter pilot. You know, still going to get shot at, blah, blah. So I, I went ahead and volunteered, was accepted, and I went to flight school. Uh, nine and a half months of flight school. Learned how to fly Hueys, uh, and tactics. And when I graduated, as all the pilots, we had about 300 hours in the Huey. So, and some basic combat training and tactical training. I graduated number two out of my class, and the top three people could uh, take a transition school. So I volunteered for Chinooks. I figured they're a little bigger. They're twin engine, dual systems. Uh, maybe I have a better chance of coming back. So qualified for that, and I went on to transition for 90, uh, 90 days, and then graduated from all of that in December of uh, 1970, was sent home for three weeks, and then shipped over to Vietnam. So. The extent of my training was flight school, about 300 hours in Huey, and about, I think I accumulated about 90 hours in the Chinook when, Chinook when I showed up. Uh, when you get there, of course, I've mentioned we did a lot of uh, train, uh, flying around the area to get comfortable with the area, and then you just learned on the job. Uh, mm -hmm. Our instrument training uh, with VFR, which is visual rules, was great. Our our instrument training for uh, IFR, which is weather flying, night flying in clouds, was not real strong. Uh, the, the Army just kept uh, needed to put out a lot of pilots. So we were basically trained uh, to a level they called tactical instruments, which gave us enough to be dangerous. And we really was on the job training. Sure. When you started sure. flying at night or in weather or in the clouds, that's when you really learned how to handle it. So uh, that was well, that took a while, but eventually got comfortable with that. Well, one of, one of the, um, a lot of what comes through in your book, and I haven't finished on about halfway through, but um, it's really interesting. I think we can all relate to the, to the dynamics of, of, you know, supervision and the hierarchy and competing priorities and nice guys and not so great nice guys. Um, so when you're there, when you're on the base and sorry, if I'm not using the vocabulary, but you know, when you're in your, um, when you're not flying, um, right. when you're not out in the field and are you on your base? Are you there with people more like you or were there infantry soldiers there as well? Or is it, was it just pilots or how did that work? That's a good question. Uh, 
our unit was stationed at Fubai, which was an airfield, a one, one, uh, one runway. But most of the 101st air assets were there at Fubai, which was just south of Way, if anyone's familiar with that area. Uh, we had several Huey units. Uh, we had Cobra units, Medevac units, a Loach unit, and then uh, all three of the Chinook companies, which made up the 159th Battalion, which I was in, were all stationed there. But we were scattered all over that uh, huge base, and uh, the base was protected by a berm line all the way around it. Uh, our unit was on what was known as the east side uh, ocean front uh, side of the base. Uh, from that picture you saw, if you go way back there, you'd run into the uh, what, what, what amounted to the bay there, the ocean. That's probably about 25 miles out, and it was all sandy from that point of our base to the to the water. Uh, so, th and then we had infantry units there too to protect the place. Uh, not a lot, but uh, this was considered a secure area, which which it was at the time I was there in '71. There wasn't too much uh, uh, combat going on in that immediate area. So uh, most of the people you interacted with were other aviation types um, and some infantry and, of course, medical personnel. Sure. Our particular unit had our own little club. We call it the Pilots Club. On the main part of the base, there was a bigger club called the the Pilots Club. We had a mini one. We always seemed to have a little better uh, liquor supply than the main. <laughs> we usually had a lot more pilots in our little area than, than we did up on the main part, but... Uh, yeah. Chinook pilots were good at picking up stuff because we could fly in and snap it up and fly out without people seeing us sometimes or stopping us, if you will. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, it was mostly aviators and uh, and some infantry. If you went further north, Camp Eagle was the main infantry part. That's where the division's headquarter was and most of the combat units were. And then further on the other side of way was another unit called, or another camp called Camp Evans, and that was fully combat. And that was close to the Ashaw Valley. And uh, then you went up to Quang Tree, which was right on the DMZ. Uh, we had a unit up there uh, at 101st. That was, a, that was basically a combat unit, too, a smaller, I think it was a battalion. So, uh, and then they had supposedly a lot of ARV and South Vietnamese soldiers on that area helping, working with them. So, yes, the answer is it was mostly aviation, aviation type people. Okay. Oh, well, I, I know for, and in the book, and I think you may have mentioned this as well, that you took a lot of the, the, in writing um to your wife and you would you would keep diaries and um i think you mentioned that that was sort of how you remembered a lot of the events that took place there was because you journaled or in, in that so is that was you able so you were able to do that or yeah uh i think that was pretty common most of the fellows uh would write letters uh during that time frame the big thing was to do tapes little tapes the cassette tapes and send them back and forth write letters. Uh, we didn't have cell phones. <laughs> uh, this is a little aside for the, the veterans of the day that have a little more communication uh, capabilities. Uh, to call home, which was rare, we had to go to the uh, uh, operations center and use our radios, which would call and, and reach a ham operator somewhere uh, out of Vietnam, South Vietnam, maybe usually Hawaii or, or Alaska that could pick us up. And then they would use a ham operator to go to uh, wherever you were trying to get. In my case, it was Florida, Panama City, Florida. And then they would dial into a phone. So we'd get three minutes to talk back and forth to whoever you'd have to go. And it had to be short, like, hey, this is Larry. Hi, Dad, how you doing? Over. And then he'd have to come back. And it would be a delay. He didn't come back. Of course, I was married and trying to talk to you, your wife like that for three minutes. It's actually a minute and a half between all the people involved. And everything. So that didn't, you know, we didn't do that too often. Now, there was the ability to use a direct line, but that only seemed to be uh, for um, communicating with the Pentagon. Oh. <laughs> so we weren't, wow. we didn't have access to that. So it was basically tapes and letters. That it was wow. back and and uh, I kept a journal before I left. Uh, Linda and I both agreed to take uh, record uh, keep a journal and record our thoughts each day or whatever and then we'd share them at christmas uh the next year when i came back which we did sure. but i would journalize stuff that you know happened during the day that i wouldn't communicate my letters or my tapes sure of course not every day was a rough day but you'd have your share over there or you could sure. anyway so sure. those three of the three communication types that we did or the three things i did and most of the fellows did that now keeping a journal 
I have no idea. Uh, I know some other fellows in my company did, but I don't know that that was the norm. But I, yeah. I can't swear to that. Well, tell us a little bit more about, um, you know, so you're, are you stationed there for a year? Was that a just set? That was your tour, I guess. Your tour of duty was for one yes. year? Yes. Yeah. I was stationed there for a whole year. That was the norm. You'd come in and do a year and then rotate out um, unless you were wounded or something happened that they needed to reassign you somewhere else. In my company, uh, the year I was there, this Lamson thing lasted nine, 60 days, uh, started February, ended the uh, first week of April. We, we lost some fellas and a lot of guys were wounded, so there was new guys coming in. And then after that thing settled down, the war on our area was winding down somewhat. So uh, we went from a high intensity, never enough pilots uh, in uh, late January through the end of, uh, going into almost the end of May. And then all of a sudden we just had all the pilots we needed. <laughs> so yes. uh, we were launching maybe three ships a day doing routine missions. So uh, very rarely did we uh, have a lot of aircraft in the air uh, or see a lot of uh, of, of combat. Well, we saw some, but not much. The 101st was in the I Corps, which was in the northern part of Vietnam. And uh, it was supposedly one of the better units the entire war. And they always went looking for a fight. Matter of fact, the NVA used to call us the chicken men because the Vietnamese didn't know anything about eagles, but they knew a lot about chickens. And they saw our eagles on our shoulders and on our helicopter. And uh, they used to refer to us as the chicken men. And, and the, if the chicken men were coming, they wanted to get out of there because they knew we were going to fight until we got them. Sure, sure. So it was, it was a pretty tough unit to be in. And that, that went on the whole year I was there in 71, but it wasn't as intense as the first four months. So tell us a little bit about, um, and I know we could listen and, and talk for hours, of course. And I want to kind of kind of transition to you're moving out of the service and then choices that you had available to you after that, because you were very young and. Yeah, well, you had uh, a lot I, got of out, uh, I was released from the service in uh, uh, September of 73. Uh, when I came back, I was assigned to Benning and general staff and uh, didn't uh, uh, basically did my minimum flying each month. I'd had enough flying for a while uh, having come back. Uh, and they, the military back then was doing what they called rifts, beginning in 72 and 73 and 74, reduction in force. And they were letting out, uh, particularly officers and, and certain NCOs, uh, in large numbers. Then they had standard, uh, they had uh, criteria for doing that. I didn't meet that criteria. I still had several years left, and, uh, but I wanted to go ahead and get out and start a civilian career. I just wanted to give that a shot. And I applied for that. And uh, the officers I worked for at the time, two colonels and a general, uh, they kind of wanted me to stay in, but they understood and they worked to help me uh, transition. And unbeknownst to me, and this is important for veterans, uh, networking and having a good uh, reputation in, in your service time, uh, the general and these two colonels, uh, and I've never forgotten that, uh, went out of their way to call civilian uh, uh, CEOs and presidents. I wanted to go into banking, but they uh, ended up uh, talking to the presidents of five banks and uh, four or five different major companies. And, I, and every one of them called me up for an interview. I had no wow. idea these fellows were doing that. I like, started getting all these calls in, uh, in August, early August. Ended up going out on interviews um, and I was several, received several off offers and I joined uh, uh, a bank called Fourth National Bank, which was part of the trust company bank system back at that time. Sure. And uh, went on their management program uh, and, and, of course, left the service. Uh, one of the things that was difficult for me, and I know it was for a lot of fellas, and I'm sure it is even that way today, was transitioning from being a military person to being a civilian person and uh, getting settled into that uh, particular uh, career path, if you will. Uh, being a captain and an, arm, and an aviator, but I was making quite a bit of money back then. Uh, and starting in banking career as a management trainee on an 18-month program was a little difficult. I took a pretty big pay cut. Oh, really? <laughs> Just got to deal with that and work through it. And the bigger, some of the bigger problems I had was, uh, you know, being what I had gone through and what I did was uh, 
just kind of coming back to earth and, and learning the basics of banking and going through this program. I mean, I went from flying helicopters and being shot at to counting cash and working uh, teller windows. I mean, it's, it's not quite the same thing. So it was a little bit of an adjustment there. Uh, I guess you got to work through, but uh, you, it'll eventually uh, get get there. And um, within 18 months, I was promoted an officer and then my banking career took off. Awesome. I, well, I, I want to share our next photo. So I'm kind of I'm kind of leapfrogging through your life. Okay. Uh, I want to share this next page. And then after this, I'm going to turn it over. Uh, well, we're going to talk a little bit about this and a little bit about your book. I want to definitely leave some time for, for questions and, you know, the discussion of veterans in higher education too. Um, let me share this screen. And so that you've been very active in the community. You're obviously staying in touch with veterans of, of all ages. And so if, if you don't mind, just tell us in a few minutes about the photos that you shared with me here. I have a little bit of caption, but they're fascinating. Sure. Well, since since uh, getting out of the service, I've always been uh, active with veterans activities. Uh, I call it under the radar. I've never uh, I didn't get out front. I was always doing things uh, to interact with them and help when I could. The picture on the top left is me with my grandson. Uh, we were. We were at Tacoa uh, in October of 2010, Tacoa, Georgia, the Band of Brothers, the Easy Company, the one, from the, the 508, uh, you know, parachute regiment. And the, uh, I don't know if they still do it, but they had uh, uh, those that were surviving and could make it. They'd come back to for a three-day weekend there, and I took my grandson up, and we met some of the survivors. That's a picture of one of them, well, two of them there on the right, one standing and the guy standing, his name is Ed, and I can't remember the fellow sitting down, but these are fellows that jumped in on D-Day. Uh, yeah, it's amazing. On the right uh, is uh, me with the current uh, Golden Knights, the Army Parachute uh, uh, team. Uh, met them uh, uh, last, uh, last summer when they were here to do the kickoff ceremony for the uh, a six-hour Le Mans race at Road Atlanta. And uh, we spent some time together. When I was in the service at Denning to keep my eight hours, one of the things I would do is uh, fly a Huey and uh, with the current team, and they were called the Black Knights back then, parachute team. And we'd, we'd take them up 10,000 feet and they'd jump out and then we'd you know, float. They'd, you know, of course, fly, uh, drop down and then we'd fly off a little bit and spiral down, pick them up, and they'd put on new shoots and go back up and practice. And I would wow. do that with them. Uh, so it was kind of a, a nifty uh, group to meet. And bottom there is a picture of a Veterans Day ceremony um, in Dawson County. I was a member of uh, the Dawson County Veterans Alliance for several years. And I was very fortunate to be asked to be an MC for pretty much uh, several events over about a 10 year period, usually Veterans Day, sometimes uh, Memorial Day. This particular event was a pretty big one, just kicking off in the Jim at the middle school there. Yeah. Oh, some very young looking um, army folks there. Uh, those are R ROTCs from the oh. uh, high school there in, in Dawson County. Oh, Where okay. You, Interesting. Yeah. Well, I'm going to move on to the next slide. And now you're, you're yet another career, your writing career. So tell us a little bit about your, uh, about your book. Um, and that's your writing spot. So just take a minute or two to tell us about that, please. Yeah, my book there, I'm uh, very proud of that. Uh, I hope it does well. Um, I carried a story with me basically since coming back and buried everything until the late 80s. Uh, when I saw the movie Platoon, like a lot of veterans uh, from Vietnam, it kind of was like going back to Vietnam again. And uh, I think Oliver Stone uh, packed a lot into two hours and maybe it was a little over the top, but certainly uh, gave a lot of people more appreciation for what the guys on the ground <laughs> went through. I thought that'd be great to uh, to do the same kind of thing for helicopter pilots because they were central to the war. And uh, make a long story short, I uh, started thinking about maybe doing a screenplay and I wrote Oliver Stone uh, directly and said, I've got this concept about this and uh, be in, want to know if you'd be interested in uh, hearing it, uh, I know you've done uh, two movies now, and you're supposedly going to do a trilogy about Vietnam. About a month later, uh, he writes me back and said he was going to do a, a third one. He's already got the concept, and he thought my idea was good and recommended uh, that maybe I consider writing a screenplay and trying to 
market it to some production companies and then gave me some suggestions and ideas. So I, I uh, took that to heart. And in 1990 and 91, I uh, read some screenplays, did some research and then sat down and wrote uh, a screenplay. It took me about a year titled Flying Pachyderms, uh, which was a, a short version of uh, Lamson and uh, from a, a combat helicopter position or perspective and, and call it the, after my unit, the flying packet. Uh, got that, wrote, wrote that, uh, passed it around, uh, finalized it, and then uh, entered it in the screenwriting contest and got it in a mention. But make a long story short, nobody picked it up and everybody kept telling me, you really need to tame that into a book. So uh, after about two years of doing all that, I was, oh, that's a good idea, but man, I'm, I'm burned out. So I just put everything in a big box, put it away. And a couple of years back, I started getting this idea, you know, I'm not getting any younger. I really want to get this out there and see what happens. So I pulled the box out, started looking at it. And then, of course, COVID comes along in uh, January, February of last year. And I thought, well, I'm not going anywhere anyway, so I'll just start writing this book. And I spent about six months, put it together, uh, had a manuscript, identified a couple of local publishers and uh, uh, talked with... Uh, publish authority here in Atlanta, in Atlanta and Roswell, and they also have office out in California. And uh, to make a long story short, they were interested in my story. I sent it to them, and then within a week or so, they got back to me and said, I think you've got something you can work with there. Let's work together and turn it into a book. So I signed a contract with them, and we worked on it. And uh, it was a great experience. They're really good people to work with. I think Frank and uh, is on, on this now. He's the... Uh, publishing of, from the public. Oh, great. great, welcome. And uh, I think Bob, uh, who is one of my main editors on here also, uh, thanks to both of them. Uh, and we came out with this book and uh, here's where we are, so. Well, and it's wonderful. And I know um, I'm gonna stop sharing this cause I'm gonna hand this over to you in just a minute. Uh, uh, I'll leave this here um, and I'm gonna stop sharing, go back to our big screen. I just wanna, Set, just kind of wrap up the library part in that, you know, remembering veterans experiences is an initiative for, for a lot of people, but libraries and museums in particularly want to hang on to this information in your stories. And if you don't write about them or record them in some way, a lot of times it's lost. And so, you know, the part about you forget that you couldn't call your family or that you could, you know, it took so much effort to make a one minute phone call. And those stories are so important to, to history and to archives and stuff. So, you know, we're appreciative of, of all that because it's so important for just, just our national history. So I'm going to go ahead and pass this over to Terrell to talk about, you know, helping just like you had your service experience and then you just, you made so much out of that and made so much out of your life. I think it's an inspiration and I think the, the veterans and um, it's such a great story. So could turn it over to our veteran, Terrell. Awesome, thank you. Appreciate that, Ms. Deborah. You're uh, welcome. First of all, Mr. Larry, we wanna thank you for your service. Um, you are a true American hero, um, not only being a Vietnam War veteran, uh, that has a lot of prestige within itself because you made it back. And not only did you made it back, you survived because back then, um, it was not glamorized being a Vietnam veteran. It's not how to look upon. Um, a lot of those gentlemen got they got a bad bad deal. They got a bad deal. And not till recently, the last twenty plus years, we have been able to recognize our Vietnam veterans for heroes that they are. And I just want to thank you and commend you for your service. Sure. Um, so I, I would just like to take over, share with everybody who does who have no idea, who may not know. I am the veteran engagement advisor here. At Gwinnett Technical College, I am an 11-year veteran, or a veteran on top of that. I did two tours to Iraq as a corpsman. Uh, so my first tour, I was on a ship. I floated for eight plus months. Um, I took Marines um, uh, in in and out of CONUS. So long story short, um, I did a lot of medical duty. So the Marines that were on the ship, I took care of them, and then when they came back on the ship, uh, before we transferred them to wherever they needed to go. Um, took care of them as well. So I did my basically majority of my career, even though I'm a Navy guy, I spent a lot of time with the Marines. Um, individuals who do not know the Marine Corps is a department of the Navy. And why not? <laughs> uh, a lot of people don't know that. A lot of Marines like to joke and say it's the men's department, but whatever. <laughs> 
or uh, whatever. But long story short, um, that was the extent of my career. Two tours of Iraq, the first was on the ship. Um, the second tour to Iraq, um, I, I was kicking indoors and looking for weapons of mass destruction for about eight months, um, not, not over a year. Unfortunately, or fortunately, um, the Army, they have the longest tours, um, sitting from a year to almost two years um, when they're over in a um, war zone. Uh, but long story short, that allowed me to uh, serve my time. I did 11 years was able to get out of the military, finish up in school, and then work with the VA, uh, which then introduced me to VA law, uh, then introduced me uh, to a lot of different doors, and then I came to Winnipeg. Tech. So now I'm here helping our veterans and independents. I'm under the tutelage of Travis Simpson, who was our manager, our coordinator, a uh, guy of many hats. With that being said, I'm able to help our veterans and our veteran dependents, our dependents at the school. And one of the things that we do and we like to do, we try to make sure that our students are taken care of. With Gwinnett Tech being a flagship school, um, meaning we're the top of the top, we're the top tier, we are what everyone looks at. Um, we most definitely try to keep those high standards. Uh, but not only those high standards, we are ranked nationally um, as number two as a veteran friendly school. Um, so there, I don't know how many schools that are out there. I know there are a ton of them, um, but we have that title, and it is a title that we hold, and that we're very proud of. That allow that allows us to take care of our veterans, um, as far as make sure their benefits are taken care of, their educational benefits. That is our specialty. Uh, we have individuals in our office uh, that, that can take take care of each spectrum make sure that our veterans and our dependents have a very successful college career from the time that they begin to the time that they end. And um, then I come in with a little special asterisk where I'm able to help them with their um, VA questions that they may have as um, far as their VA benefits and, and things that matter. So I'm able to go in a little bit more detail um, than what they would normally get and probably save them some time for going to the VA or just answer a general question. Even though I don't work for the VA anymore, I'm able to answer those questions very with, with high confidence and to make sure that our veterans are taken care of. Um, uh, so with that being said, uh, Mr. Larry, you, you, you said a lot of words with a lot of acronyms <laughs> and a lot of letters. <clears throat> um, that's and, and what I try to do um, in the notes here in the chat, I tried to write down each one I can think of because I understood what they were uh, because, of course, I have I know military terminology and military jargon. Um, but the other people, they may not have understood, of course, not being uh, in the Army and different branches. Of course, each branch has their own jargon. I've been blessed to work with each branch of service from Air Force to Army to Marine Corps to even Coast Guard. Uh, so with that being said, I kind of got a, a gist of it all. But long story short, we're here. Uh, we support all of our veterans and dependents, and we're very, very happy. And um, one of the things that we like to do here at Gwinnett Tech and the Veteran Affairs Office is support our veterans through the, through the SBO, Student Veteran Organization, where our student veterans and uh, dependents can interact with each other, um, being with different programs, different things that we like to offer. And uh, even though COVID has hit, it has slowed us down a little bit, but we plan on revving it up, uh, especially with the laws and regulations that are lightening up. So we plan on um, putting everything back in full gear uh, put the full pro press court, uh, full press court on for our veterans and dependents, so we can take care of them. And um, I know I don't have that much time, but if anyone had any questions, please let us know. We um, do have, sure. we have a few, we have a few, and thank you, Terrell. Um, Terrell, and I have, um, let's see, a um, couple of questions about what are your favorite parts about writing, Mr. Mr. Freeland, and do you have advice for veterans, other veterans who might want to write a book? Good questions. Um, my favorite part of the writing is uh, coming up with a general storyline. Now, granted, that was my first novel. I started working on a second one uh, and the characters and then just start writing and, and living through the characters. Uh, I, my wife could attest to that when I was doing uh, chariots uh, and I really got into it. She'd have to pull me out of my office. I'd be so into what I was trying to capture and and, and Put down on paper uh, and i'm working on my new one here i'm i've got my main character and i'm starting to he's starting to get in my mind and and he starts to take over uh i recently read a book by by uh, uh stephen king it was recommended to me by my editor 
it was a great book and uh, there's many things in there. If anybody out there wants to think about writing, I would recommend it. And thanks to Frank for recommending it. <laughs> but he says a lot of things, but one of the things that he, he that I took away from that was he writes through his characters. He says, like, it takes me a while to get my character. And once I get my character, he says, I may have a storyline, but I let my characters take over, live through them and see where they take me. He said, have a lot of faith in that and see see where you end up. So for me, I just, I enjoyed uh, do, writing through the character. Well, I'm certainly no Stephen King, but <laughs> I must have started, right? If that's what I want to do. But I highly recommend that book. And uh, what would be my advice? Well, uh, again, being that was my first one, um, I would say, again, this has been recommended to me by my, by my editor, and it was in uh, Stephen King's book. Uh, read a lot and then start writing a lot. You you know, the more you read, the better you're going to be able to write and vice That's versa. True. So it's That's just true. something you got to get into and do it. Now, I was not a big reader up to this point in my life. I've read a lot of books over 74 years of my life, but I'm not a big reader. My wife reads a book, a couple books a week. Uh, but I'm a more of a, uh, a visual guy. I like uh, DVDs and things like that, screenplays. I'm a movie buff, if you will. But uh, so reading a lot and, and writing, if that's what you want to do. And then getting your hands on some good books. And of course, I've already mentioned one. But when you when you start, obviously, be committed to it. Don't give up. Just keep going. Uh, it's not <laughs> that's true. You go, you start and you stop and you start and you stop it you won't get very far. You know, it's the old tank in the sand. He's going to be running its engine, but it ain't going to get very far up the beach. <laughs> well, I'm going to go ahead and go to our last screen for a second. Let me share that back with you. And then I got to pop out for a second, but um, I'm going to leave this here for a second. I'm going to, this is our lib guide. So everybody here, this is um, our information about military science and veteran resources and speaking of books, we have a lot of great books. A lot of them are eBooks. So all you have to do is click on the links. Really um, a lot of fascinating content and writers of memoirs, um, uh, really great stuff. So if you haven't had a chance to go to that on our website, we encourage you to do that. Um, also uh, put the Veterans Affairs link because we want to make sure that we're kind of keeping the circle going of, of helping our veterans. And then I definitely, um, Mr. Freeland has such great uh, information on his website, lots of, uh, of media articles, which I really enjoyed reading the articles and the interviews that um, that you've had, Mr. Freeland. They're just really, really interesting. And like I said, you have such a rich source of, of material for, for your writing. And um, it, unless we have any more questions, let me stop sharing that right here. And we're back on our main screen. Did anybody else have any more questions? We have we have a few minutes. All right. Well, if you think of anything and um, just get in touch with us, and I'll, I'll send them to Mr. Freeland. And like uh, said, I'm, I said, and I definitely want to say thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Eastland, um, for providing me with that preview copy of your book. It actually goes on sale next week, right? April twenty first, I believe it is. Is that when it actually goes on sale? I think, yes. So I've got a preview copy um, and um, that's great. I've, I've never written a professional review. I'll try to do that because I am enjoying it and I have read a lot of books and I've read a lot of reviews for sure. So um, good luck with everything. I know you have another book that you're planning. So keep us in mind. I hope everyone's enjoyed our, our kind of combo uh, event, author event. Um, again, it's been a very educational experience and um, we have a recording of it. So we should be able to, for people that weren't able to, to um, attend live and I get it. Um, we should have a good recording. I missed a little bit at the beginning, but I think we got the bulk of it. Okay. Anything else you want to say, Mr. Freeland? Oh, well, just thank you for the opportunity. I really sure. enjoyed it and I uh, hope everyone that buys the book enjoys the book and uh, right. certainly like to hear from you if you do. Yes, and we, we plan on adding the copy to the library, too, so people can check it out from the library as well. Well, thank you so much. I guess we'll wrap it up here. I enjoyed it so much. And uh, let us know if we can provide any assistance to anybody. And everybody have a great day. Thank you. 
All right. Thank you. Thank you, Travis. Thank you, Terrell. Thank, Thank you. you all, everybody.